This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. Today we got a Dell Field. Actually, they're just complaining about the cold rail up here not working. They're saying that it just stopped working over the weekend. So uh, this one has actually had some interesting stuff done to it. So um, because they're in a high ambient environment, the kitchen gets really hot. We actually had to separate it. it. Used to have a single condensing unit that ran the top and the bottom, and we actually have the condensing unit in there running the bottom now. And we added a condensing unit right here that runs just the top. So keep that in mind when we're troubleshooting. All right. So we've got a condensing unit here with the receiver. We have a power switch right here, and then. Um, uh, it's got a low pressure control and a high pressure control. We've got a time clock that turns it on and off at nighttime. And then we have a temperature controller that's been added back in here. Solenoid valve and, I'm sorry, uh, temperature controller and solenoid valve right here. So, um, first off, this solenoid valve is red hot. So that indicates to me that the temperature controller more than likely is calling, but we're certainly going to go through it. Um, and the condensed unit is not running at all. Looking at the defrost clock, we have a green light, which indicates that it's not in defrost. Um, the time is 9 a.m. The time is correct. It shuts off from 1 a.m. to 4 a.m. and then just runs all day long, Con you know, controlled by the temperature control. We're gonna open this guy up and look back in here. All right, the way that we made this unit, this thing literally just pulls right off. It's just the cover that I had made keep a filter media right there filters not bad um, condenser looks dirty so we can slide this condensing unit out there's no schematic for this because it's a custom unit but I made it so and you see I got a service loop back there um, low pressure and high pressure control interrupt line voltage to the condensing unit so let's push the high pressure control there we go condenser parameter starts right up so we're gonna start by uh, watching the unit operate. We'll put some service gauges on there. We'll probably end up cleaning the condenser, but I wanna see it operate first. So the sight glass cleared right up, so I don't think we're gonna be low on gas. I'm still gonna gauge up just to check it out. It's moving air. It's not really hot as it stands blowing out. I mean, it's warm, but I have a feeling what happened here. You see that trash can right there? I have a feeling they put it right there and blocked the condenser off. That happens a lot in these restaurants but we're gonna to continue to go through it and we'll clean the condenser anyways. I joined the Knipix family. Super stoked, I'm digging these so far. All right, the box is running, it's coming down. Um, the superheat is really swinging when the valve opens and closes. So typically you wanna run about six to eight degrees superheat. This is a static cold rail, meaning there's no fan motor up there. Um, we just have covers blocking it right now. Uh, but watch the super heat now. It's going to climb all the way up to like 25, 30, and then it's going to go back down. But again, the box is still pulling down in temperature right now. Um, this is not a really accurate temperature, but it says it's 55 in there right now. If we go over here, temp control says 34, but that temp control is actually just grabbing the suction line temperature. You can see the sensor right there. It's just grabbing the suction line temp. So it's probably set for like zero degrees or something. These things, you're, you're, they're not like super precise, but we're gonna let it run for a little bit longer. Um, the sight glass is clear running, so that's a good sign. Um, I'm not seeing abnormally high head pressure. Even though the condenser is a little bit dirty, it's not the end of the world. So uh, it's normal too on these, you know, as far as rules of thumb, you're probably only gonna run maybe 15 degrees over ambient probably. Uh, let's see what the condenser TD is right now. Condenser TD is about 14.8, yeah, so. And right now the EVAP T is 56 degrees, but again, it's still pulling down. You know, you gotta be careful using these numbers. Um, and we're not getting a very super accurate measurement. I've got a temperature probe underneath the pans. It's not super, super highly accurate. Uh, I'm not seeing anything that's scaring me too much right now. Discharge line temp wasn't too high. Subcooling is non-existent, but it's because it has a receiver. You're not gonna get a really good measurable subcooling on this guy. So we're gonna watch it run for a little bit longer and then uh, we're gonna clean the condenser and then see how that affects the performance. All right, we are seriously stabilizing out now. So what I did was I actually went and put empty pans in there and filled all the gaps. And I've got my air probe in there. So it's about 33 degrees underneath the pans at the moment. Um, everything's looking good here, 78 degree air. 
Uh, superheat still kind of the valves opening and closing, um, but it drops down to about six degrees and then it kind of goes back and forth. As it stabilizes out more and more, it'll calm down. So we start by pre-rinsing just with hot water, get it wet, then we're gonna put the coil cleaner on there. Notice how even though I sprayed it from the front, it's actually pulling the dirt out because you can see dirt in that crap. It's pretty cool how it works. This is the Viper condenser coil cleaner. And we can uh, just start rinsing it off and you'll see it pull the stuff out. It does a pretty darn good job. If you got a really greasy environment, then I go get the Viper HD cleaner out of the van, but this does a really good job if you don't want to make a huge production out of it. And you can see this stuff's coming out of there pretty good. All right, it's coming nice and clean, just doing another final rinse, but you can see what a difference that condenser looks like. So this stuff does really well. While I'm here too, I'm gonna go ahead and pull that guy out and clean that guy since I'm right next to it, so. Another thing I wanna point out is on these pole rails, you wanna see even, even frost patterns all the way around you want to see it nice and even all the way across what can happen is these refrigeration lines there's a refrigeration line right there it can become separated it's usually like tack welded or something so you always want to pay attention to that even frost lines now above that's going to be hard because it's affected by the ambient conditions heat lamps and different things like that but below you want to see even frost lines all right this guy's looking good um we're not gonna get much more out of this the box temps 29 degrees uh, the temperature controller is set for zero. It's not going to get to zero degrees in the box because, again, that's suction line temperature. It's currently suction line temp is 26 degrees according to that thermostat. Um, so we use suction line temp just because you can't get an accurate reading on the static. But where I have my thermometer up in the top is reading, what did I say? 29 degrees so that's pretty darn close reading the suction line temp but yeah we're looking good right now the superheat ranges when the valve opens and closes so it's uh, usually maintaining about six degrees superheat it kind of is hunting back and forth as it's bringing the box down to temp once it like i said earlier once it stabilizes out and gets a lot closer to set point that superheat is going to just you know hang out where it's supposed to be so you're going to see it right now it's going to drop down and it's gonna hang right around six, eight degrees and just hang right there. So it's not like it's dropping it down to zero, it's actually maintaining. So we're looking good. We're gonna call this one done. We're gonna tell the customer to make sure they don't put stuff in front of that, uh, that panel. And uh, I went ahead and cleaned that one too while I had it apart. Yeah, we're good to go. So that's it on this one. All right, sometimes um, it can be things that aren't as obvious as you'd imagine. You know, uh, it was really easy for me to think, hey, it was just a dirty condenser. But once I put my service gauges on it before I cleaned it, and you know, and it wasn't that bad. Um, and then also the amount of heat coming out being rejected out of the condenser wasn't that bad. And you start to notice things the more you work on stuff. You know, you, you notice that, hey, if it's, if it's a dirty condenser, you notice that, you know, it, it's really hot you know, uh, the heat coming out of the condenser or, you know, you just start to notice certain signs. Okay. So in this situation, I really don't think the problem had anything to do with the dirty condenser. I'm sure it escalated the issue a little bit, but the condenser, I don't know if you guys saw too, I really didn't point it out on the video, but you could actually see light. If you go back and look, you can see light through the condenser, even though there was some gunk, you know, some, some lint and stuff on there. So I really think that what happened was the customer had pushed that trash can in front of there and cause the unit to go off on high head pressure or trip the high pressure control, okay? Once, uh, it's now been about a week since I did that call. Um, we've had no more complaints, the customer was happy. Another thing I kinda wanted to point out too is, you know, cleaning the other condenser, 
right? The one for the base section, because I already had the cover off. I had my stuff right there. It's just something that you should, you know, try to be smart. And I try to be as polite as possible to these customers. In this situation, I put the pan under the condenser, kind of sloped it down and cleaned it so all the, the, you know, the water just goes into the pan. And it makes less of a mess for me to have to clean up after the fact, okay? Uh, when it comes to these cold rail boxes too, you know, a lot of people do ask questions about the cold rails. How do they work? Okay, um, it's pretty basic refrigeration right there. Okay, so the refrigeration lines, the copper lines are affixed to the other side of that stainless steel. Typically what they do um, in the newer boxes, they actually affix them and then fill it with glycol. Now this is an older one, so I don't think it has the glycol bath inside of it. But um, generally, the cold rail, there's something affixing the copper line. Now, if you've ever seen one make uh, made, they'll usually take like little stainless steel brackets and just kind of tack the stainless steel brackets on the copper, hold it to the wall, and then um, they'll fill it with some sort of an insulating foam. Uh, and then, you know, that's your, your uh, evaporator, essentially, is what it becomes, okay? they're not the most efficient in the world. Uh, you guys noticed that I had mentioned in the video that we had it set at zero degrees for the temperature controller, okay? Because of the high ambience here, this box does not work very well in the summertime. They have a hard time. And a lot of times when people have these units, one of the things they try to do, the customer, you know, when it, it hits high temps in one weird spot, usually it's because there's warm air radiating down and it you know, there's a heat lamp or some sort of heat source is causing heat and it, it has a hard time. It needs to have that even frost all the way around. So oftentimes what the customers will do is they think they're going to solve a problem by filling that ice bath with ice cubes. OK, that actually creates a bigger issue. Um, the reason why they can't fill them with ice cubes is because an ice cube is 32 degrees, right? So even if you put water inside there, the coldest you're ever really going to get in there is 32 degrees. It creates a problem. It acts almost as an insulator. Now, yes, I understand if it gets colder and colder and colder, eventually it could drop below 32. But you got to understand these boxes, they don't, you know, they put 40 degree food in them, okay? So in order for the ice cubes to get below I mean, the ice that the bath, the slush or slurry, you want to call it, that they end up making by putting ice and water inside that bath, in order for it to get below 32 degrees, it would also have to bring the food temperature that's in the pans below 32 degrees. You know, it just, it, it never really happens. So by putting ice and water in there, they actually keep the temperature higher. Um, by taking everything out, usually the biggest issues with these cold rails is they're not sealing the pans 100%. And I'm talking even the slightest bend in the top. They have to be 100% sealed. You cannot have beat up, bent pans that have little air gaps. That just ruins everything. It has to be completely sealed. That's an important thing, too, is if you read any of the installation instructions from the manufacturers or the service instructions, technically... The customer is supposed to rotate the food with new cold food every couple of hours, which is kind of ludicrous if you think about it. So the manufacturer of that box wants the customer to put in, you know, uh, I shouldn't say 32 degrees, but they want to put food that is below 40 degrees in the pans, but then they want them to only fill the pans up about a third of the way to a halfway, and then they want them to exchange them for fresh pans with fresh cold food in there, which creates a problem for the customer's um, with like shelf life of food and stuff like that because they'd be having to take a pan that's been you know sitting there with you know some food in it put it down in the bottom it just creates an issue but um you know the biggest issue i see with these is the customer not putting the food in the top correctly coming up i have one restaurant that uh, had these brackets made so they can store bottles of ketchup and different vinegars and different things like that. So they have like a stainless steel flat plate that fits right in the spot of a, a, a pan and then it has holes in it and they just set bottles in there. Well, then all that air is escaping out of the box. It's it's just a nightmare. So these things, to be honest with you, are horrible. They, they are not efficient whatsoever. They're a pain in the butt. Um, I prefer the older style uh, that had the fan motor. Kyrak made them. Um, but those were inefficient because they had a lot of repair issues. They were the best at maintaining product temperatures, but they just had lots of service issues, drains being plugged up, fan motors going bad, units icing up, that kind of thing. So it's it's a constant battle with these. Now, there is some new technology in some of these. Uh, Kyrak makes a new box that doesn't have a fan motor in the cold rail, but they circulate glycol. They maintain a consistent temperature on the glycol. Um, those are a little bit nicer. 
Uh, this particular manufacturer of this box is Delfield. Um, they have a new technology that they actually filled the cold wrap with glycol, but it's not being circulated. It's just glycol sitting in there. Um, it works a little bit better than this particular one that's here, but anyways, I'm rambling. I really, really appreciate you guys making it to this point in the video. Uh, thank you guys so very much. Keep in mind, I do live streams Monday evenings, 5 p.m. Pacific on YouTube. I go live on the HVAC Overtime YouTube channel with my buddies on Friday evenings about 6.05 p.m. Uh, if you guys are interested in supporting the channel, please check out my website, hvacrvideos.com. I've got merch available. I'm wearing the flag shirt right now. Love this one. Um, a couple different other hoodies, beanies, hats, other shirts on my website. So that's hvacrvideos.com. Uh, you can also support me the easiest way by simply watching to this point in the video because you've watched the whole video. Leave me some feedback, a thumbs up, a thumbs down, and a comment. Uh, you can also become a Patreon patron. You can become a YouTube channel member. Yeah, and that's it. Thank you guys so very much. Make sure to stay tuned for next Thursday's video. So it'll be released Thursday, December 24th. Uh, should be released early in the morning. Um, gosh, I want to give hints, but I can't. Uh, it'll be a cool video. Some people, some people are going to be very, very happy at the end of the video because, uh, yeah, they're just going to be very, very happy. So stay tuned for that video. Okay, guys, really, really appreciate you guys, and we will catch you on the next one.